Well, Fernando, welcome to our podcast. Science <laughs> matters. <laughs> Thank you. We'll support science. <laughs> um, so I didn't ask you downstairs, but um, I read, you know, ocean sciences, earth sciences, stuff like that. But what is your official background and specialty? And if someone describes you in one word as a scientist, what is that word? What do you that word is hydrology. Um, oh, hydrology. It's science of water. Yes. And um, how did you get into that? And what, what is the science of water? And how did you get into it? Um, I got into it. You know, I um, you know I was born in the '60s, and I so I tell the story that you know I sort of uh, came of age intellectually in the 1980s. Um, uh, if you remember the 1980s, um, it was a time of race and environmental consciousness. Um, um, you know, the term sustainable development came up for the first time in the UN conference in 1987. That was the year I was graduating college. Um, Molina and, and, uh, and Sherwood Rowland at UC Irvine had detected the ozone hole uh, in the atmosphere. And that was in also in, you know, in, the, in, the, in the late 70s and early 80s, but actually in the 80s is where it really got a lot of attention. So for an impressionable young person in college, um, that sort of got me very interested in the environmental field. Um, combine that with the fact that I grew up in, in South America where water is a very big deal in terms of the impacts on everyday lives. Um, when people speak of, for example, of issues like renewable energy, Latin America's been there for decades. Uh, hydropower is the main source of uh, in energy in, uh, in Brazil, in Venezuela, where I grew up, in Colombia, and in many other countries. Um, um, so these are countries that have been living the green life for a much longer time. Um, so that got me interested in the field of water because I could, you know, as I learned more about the rest of the world, I knew and I found out that uh, other parts of the world were water scarce, you know, like Africa, uh, like the Middle East. Um, and um, so I got really interested in water at the time and, you know, that was 30 plus years ago. I didn't, haven't, haven't looked back since. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you look at, uh, if you look at the world's biggest problems, um, um, you know, um, poverty, violence, uh, environmental degradation. Um, it's, it, all of them have a common thread is that scientific knowledge is critical in improving them and trying to solve them. Um, I can't think of a single problem that society has where science doesn't play a significant role. We can see it today. I think COVID has actually put this into perspective. Uh, having, having the right science uh, at the right time could have prevented many of the deaths and many of the losses that we have suffered as a society. Um, and um, if you think about other big problems, um, you know, like climate change, which has been, has been in, the, in the arena world, world stage for decades now, um, you can see how science has, has slowly started to contribute to building consensus around how we actually solve them. Same with other problems. You can't solve these big problems without science. Mm -hmm. Okay, like in the, in the well, let's pick one problem that you feel that Mason is making a contribution to solving and go a little deeper and explain how that's happening. What's a problem you might like to cite? Um, well, I, you know, my favorite one is climate change. Um, and um, particularly because here at Mason, we have uh, the Center for Ocean Land um, Interactions, COLA, which is a, um, a world-renowned uh, cluster of knowledge for climate modeling. Climate modeling is about developing mathematical tools that allow us to predict how climate change will evolve over time. And Mason researchers are at the forefront of this field of knowledge. And as they help solve that problem, what benefit will that lead to for people? As we, as we understand better what um, the future might look like under, under different scenarios uh, of change, uh, um, populations changing, the economies are developing, um, technology is evolving. We have, um, you know, vehicles that emit, emit a, lot, a, le a lot less of fossil fuels to the atmosphere. As our way to grow food is less land intensive, as all these things sort of develop over time, climate is going to change with it. Uh, having, uh, having access and having scientists that uh, carry out their investigations around answering these questions. It's gonna give us a, a pretty good uh, hindsight as to how um, uh, things may change over time and help us um, anticipate. Okay, I wanna address that same question again, but ask you to maybe think about it through the lens of impacting people's lives. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in general, in a campaign, you know, 
the struggle with science and sometimes with engineering is that right. you know it sometimes it's hard to translate the technical solution to the impact on people's right. lives. But it's there. Right. You just right. have to do it. So right. in terms of climate change, you know, if you think about health, uh, it's clear health healthier, they're gonna be safer, they're gonna be more economically secure if we solve the climate change problem. Right. So if you kind of put it through that filter, right. you give a brief answer. How would helping solve the climate change problem, um, how would science improve people's lives? Well, I'll give you an example. Um, worldwide, over 60% of the population live near or at coastal areas. Um, the, if you think about the, m the major cities of the world, they're all in the coast. Um, climate change is causing sea levels to rise. Sea levels rising means that urban areas are getting increasingly flooded. Lots of damages, lots of human um, um, losses, not only uh, lives, but also um, e economic. Um, having science to uh, pr project and predict how that phenomena may accelerate or decelerate over time and where um, might, uh, might help us um, um, Picked up on yeah, yeah. having science. Is yes. A good place to pick yes. Up. Yes. Um, yeah. But let me see how I close it. I think what I, I think what I want to say is um, that um, um, having science, you know, ha having um, developing knowledge in these areas, um, and and this is all thread through science, is going to help us. Uh, um, let me. Uh, I'm losing that train of thought. Let me see. Um, I mean, uh, ultimately, what I want to say is that there'll be, you know, uh, less loss of lives, less loss of economic losses. But I've already sort of said that before, so I don't want to sound repetitive. Yeah, I um, I, well, I, what I want to hear is something about making people's lives better. You know, I want right. to get real. <coughs> yeah. Yes. Um, yes. Um, okay. So let me let me try this. So. Um, So, so doing research on the science that's going to help us solve climate change is going to ultimately improve human lives. It's going to do so by protecting us from the impacts of climate change, but also it's going to help us uh, to, um, to, to establish measures to take actions um, to prevent climate change or slowing down climate change so it, co it doesn't continue to affect us the way it's affecting us today. Um, so having done that example, let's talk about some of Mason's strengths. Mm -hmm. And earlier as we were sort of, you know, just sort of brainstorming it, I think what we identified as some of the top strengths were um, people, uh, you said entrepreneurship, which mm -hmm. was, was interesting to me, I hadn't heard that one before, um, <laughs> location, and then research or expertise. So it would be nice if you could hit those in one statement where we can go deeper on each one. Mm -hmm. kind of, uh, that's my follow-up question. Yeah. But think if you had like the summary paragraph where you tried to say, you know, some of our major strengths are people because, you know, location because of So it's a little bit of a challenge to do it all together in one thought, but it would be great if we had one, one thought that kind of conveys that. So thinking people, entrepreneurship, location, and research, um, what would you say are some of Mason's, Mason Science's biggest strengths? Well, I think, um, so one of the things that attracted me about coming to Mason is the uh, entrepreneurial character of the faculty here. And I'll, I'll give you an example precisely around COVID-19. So early on, um, we find that when you take a, a, a COVID-19 test, it takes a few days for the result to come back. So detecting the virus in the human body takes some time. But we found out that detecting the virus in water is immediate. So some of our scientists uh, figure out that if you were to test uh, wastewater, that's the water that comes from your homes and, and, and as sewage, if you were to able to measure COVID there, it would give you a pretty good idea quickly of where the virus is. And attacking the problem will allow you to detect hotspots much more quicker than the traditional testing that we're doing now. That has happened over the, next three or, uh, over the past three or four months. Uh, that's entrepreneurial science. If you're telling, uh, talking to a prospective student, now you probably haven't had a chance to do this in person for the last few months, but <laughs> if you're talking to a pr pr prospective student and yeah. saying, why should you come study science at Mason? What's your pitch? Why should I come study science at Mason? 
Well, I think you're gonna you're gonna do you're gonna do research with um, faculty that are young, that are energetic, um, that are starting their careers, so they're eager to explore, and you you'll get an experience like no other. I think um, I, I think another another big selling point for Mason is is locations where we are. Lo you know we're we're in the greater capital part of the country, capital region, uh, close to a myriad of federal agencies of laboratories, of private companies um, that allow a, um, numerous opportunities for professional development and for networking. That to me is the, the real attractor of Mason. What about if you were um, talking to a prospective faculty member? Why should they take the job and come work here? I think for some of the same reasons, um, but I will add one that's probably more important for, for a faculty is that is the research culture that is emerging at Mason. We do research in numerous areas that other universities aren't even tackling, and if they are, they're doing it in a very isolated way. You know, you have different disciplines of, of scientists doing research independently. Here at Mason, um, because we sort of uh, grew from a small school to a larger and larger university, and now we're the largest research university, uh, university in the Commonwealth of Virginia, um, you will have opportunities to integrate into interdisciplinary teams here much quicker than you'll be able to do it elsewhere. Interesting. Um, over, say, maybe the next decade or so, what do you think are some of the fields where, or some of the areas where Mason can make a big impact through its scientific research? I think, um, I think the whole field of health sciences is its prime. Um, I, think, um, I think it was going to happen anywhere regardless of COVID. I think what COVID has done is, is it's, um, it's a big reminder of how vulnerable we are to disease and disease transmission. Um, and the fact that uh, we need to invest a lot more resources and invest a lot more manpower in solving these problems. Um, uh, so I, I think that's one big area where we have a leg up because of, um, of the research that we're doing now. Um, I think another big area is the environment. Um, and uh, with, with that, I encompass you know, pollution, I encompass climate change, um, I, um, I encompass uh, um, air pollution, uh, water pollution. Uh, and uh, I, think, um, I think one of the, perhaps one of the biggest realizations um, that people are having now is uh, that we need nature in order to continue to survive as a species. So um, going back to conservation principles, to conserving water, to keeping the air clean, uh, to, to um, you know, not deforest or maybe aforest or reforest, I think we're, so, so this, this sort of coming back to nature is something where I think uh, civilization will go and where I think a lot of science will be needed. Nice. Um, so why should people Foundations doesn't matter. Any any philanthropist. Why should people support science at Mason? Um, I think supporting science at Mason is is, um, is attractive. Um, if you want to get a uh, return on investment, or as I like I like to call it bang for buck. Um, really, uh, an investment in Mason scientists goes a long way um, because um, we are. Um, we are innovative, we're entrepreneurial, we're looking for different ways of doing things. Um, we're not asking you to give us money to do what we've been doing for decades because we're a young institution, we haven't been doing it for decades. So I think that's, um, uh, to me, that's the reason why um, you know, someone would give to Mason and someone would invest in science in Mason. Good. Um, similar question, but with a focus on impact. A as a donor to Mason, what kind of impact can I help make happen that's going to improve the world or improve people's lives? Um, um, I, think, um, I think investing in, in, our, in our research op operation is, is, um, is probably a very valuable contribution in, what, in one that will generate return. And by that I mean investing in our faculty, investing in our students, uh, investing in seeding innovative ideas that we can investigate about new ways of solving problems that are emerging. Um, and I think that's, I think that package, it's, uh, it's where I think uh, that will be most helpful from, from donors and from um, other stakeholders that want to invest in science. Okay, thanks. Um, downstairs you mentioned this and I forgot to follow up, but I wanted to follow up about diversity mm -hmm. of people <laughs> and thought and so on. 
So uh, is, is science, is the student body at Mason diverse now, and how does that benefit uh, science here? Yes, I, 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 you know, Mason is a very diverse university as a whole. Uh, you know, um, you know if, depending on which numbers you look at, almost half of our student population is, is um, uh, of, um, of underrepresented groups, uh, in, um, and that means, um, for example, women in science. And, and, and that's a great example for the College of Science. Our undergraduate student body is over 60% female. That's completely unprecedented. Uh, at the graduate level, we're 50-50. That's all also completely unprecedented. Uh, many universities across the country, across the world, will be salivating at a figure like that. Um, so these are these are figures, uh, and and we also that we're also diverse ethnically um, with uh, underrepresented groups, Hispanics, uh, African Americans, and other you know other uh, segments of the population that have been traditionally underrepresented in in science. Um, this diversity is something uh, that we can leverage uh, to continue to grow it, and to me, it's one of the big legacies that Mason uh, can lend the, f the future of science in this country and in the world. Why is it you, that you think we're successful at attracting women to science at Mason? Because as you said, that's difficult to do in some places. Um, to be completely honest, I'm still trying to figure the answer to that question myself because the, 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 the one thing I did when I first learned about that statistic is that I started to look up how were other universities doing. Um, I looked at the University of Maryland, which is across town, which is the university I came from. They're, they're barely hitting 30% um, uh, females in, um, as undergraduates in science. So um, I don't know what the answer to that is yet, um, but I, I do want to find out. Do we have, how are we doing in faculty? Our faculty also, we, we are almost 30% of our female, uh, of our faculty body is female. Um, that probably compares to 20% at other places that are, that are similar. Um, or, you know, so that, that's still pretty good. Um, I, I suspect it is because we are a young university. And a young university that has grown fast, um, means that uh, you you know the growth of faculty has had to, has had to keep up with the growth of the, st of the student body so when you open up the the hiring um, sort of pipeline uh, you're able to catch more women um, and um, that is that I think that has happened uh, with the faculty I think that also explains uh, the students um, uh, but again I don't have I don't have the hard data to back this up it's really my hypothesis as a scientist you know, it would be a neat little research project uh, just for someone here at Mason to help answer that question. So yeah. we'll wrap up so you have to get yeah. to Yeah, that's a little behind. It's actually 3 o'clock right now. Okay. Um, but is there anything else that you would like to say? And we'll come back. You know, we'll talk again if you want to. Whatever sure. If you want, as you, you know, grow, you know, you know, learn more about the, the position, etc. Is there anything else you'd like to say that I didn't think to ask um, right now that you think is relevant? Or if you were trying to persuade people to give or anything like that? You know, there's um, um, recently I was looking um, at the um, um, the Times ranking of uh, universities worldwide. Okay, and um, I came across uh, the fact that uh, George Mason is the top ranked institution in the United States. Uh, in the age of 50, 50 plus um, years old as an, as an institution. Um, I was surprised that Mason wasn't making more noise about this. Uh, and actually the reason I um, found out is because I learned that University of California at Merced was number two. And Florida International University is an institution I know very well because I was, I was a faculty there a while back, is number three. When I found out who's number one, it was Mason. Uh, it, was, it wasn't publicized any, anywhere in the media. Um, in, in the Mason media. So I was surprised a little bit of that. Um, I, think, um, I think we need to, I think we need to understand, I think we're very successful. I think we need to uh, do our work to understand why so we can leverage it and make it even better. To me, to me that's a uh, sort of a task that's pending. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, we'll let you get to your next thing. Thank you, Fernando. We'll wrap up. Thank you. Um, the, uh,